six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's face it, I got it wrong. I never thought they'd make it. I had all the facts in front of me, but I never believed them. Putting computer power in the hands of the individual. <laughs> they had to be joking. At the time, I remember that Tom Lawrence and Michael Spindler started up Apple Europe in Brussels back in 1980. Behind a wealth of ideas, there were obviously people who really believed. Then the manufacturing plant at Cork in Ireland was made operational. The European Support Center in Zeist, the Netherlands, was opened. My advisor told me that Apple wasn't dreaming the impossible dream. Why didn't I listen to him? One person, one computer, huh? At the time, the Apple II Euro Plus was setting new standards for the industry and generating 25 million dollars in sales. With only six people in Europe, Apple still went public in December 1980. The French came on the scene in 1981 and Apple set up its headquarters in Paris. I told myself that Apple wouldn't be able to keep up the pace I hadn't counted on the flair and vision of Jean-Louis Gasset, who was made head of Apple France. He was destined to put the French on the road to years of continuing success. It seemed that nothing would stop Apple. Europe was particularly receptive to Apple's revolutionary ideas and philosophy. But as far as I was concerned, what they did was their business. With only 80 people, Apple Europe managed to achieve $60 million in sales. I stayed completely unimpressed. They were out of control. They were growing too fast. It would all be over very soon. But still, subsidiaries were opened in the United Kingdom and Germany in 82 while Apple Europe generated $90 million with only 280 people. Then, in December, Apple reached the $1 billion annual sales rate. They had a good year, and I had a bad one. So what? Then they brought out the Apple IIe. After the revolution, the evolution. Apple was taking Europe by storm, or so they said. Then came Lisa and a mouse of all things. Apparently, Lisa was history in the making with windows, pull down menus, high resolution graphics, and that notorious mouse. The possibilities were endless, but not for me. In April 1983, John Scully was appointed Apple's new president and chief executive officer. The following month, Apple entered Fortune 500. Good for them. I started thinking, perhaps there is something there. Subsidiaries were opened in Holland and Ireland, and 83 sales went up to $130 million with 400 people. The excitement was getting contagious. The moment came and people started talking. The most advanced technology in personal computing, the next industry standard, a concept stunning in its simplicity. 1984, the birth of Macintosh. And next, the Cork facility started producing localized Macs for Europe. And Apple opened up subsidiaries in Italy, Austria, Belgium, and Sweden. Wasn't that when Soren Olsen, today's president, 
joined Apple. And sales rose again to $200 million with 552 people. <laughs> it was almost too good to be true. Then came the proof. In 1985, Apple experienced its first ever quarterly loss. Undismayed, John Scully announced a major reorganization. I wasn't too sure about the impact of the reorganization, but then Michael Spindler was appointed vice president of Apple Computer International to take Apple from strength to strength. Apple's plans for the future in education impressed me enormously. At Lund University in Sweden, Apple launched the European University Consortium, made up of leading colleges and universities. There was more to come. Apple pioneered desktop publishing with the launch of the LaserWriter. At the same time, Apple Talk broke new ground in connectivity. Sales, incidentally, rose again to $230 million with 518 people. My faith was boosted still further in 1986 with the introduction of Apple Centers dedicated to Apple products and the Apple environment. That year, sales rose once more to $342 million with 616 people. By 87, 5 million Apple personal computers had been sold. 1 million of them were Macs. Now they were really talking. <laughs> I bought in. And in March, spearheaded by the new open architecture Mac 2, $479 million in sales were achieved with 763 people. By the end of 87, Apple could do absolutely no wrong in my eyes. I did some celebrating too in 88, when Apple Computer Europe Incorporated was born. They celebrated with $875 million in sales, generated by 1,129 staff. And then in 89 with the Mac Portable. In March 1990, Soren Olsen was appointed president of Apple Europe, and Michael Spindler became number two in Apple. October saw another major milestone for Apple, the Macintosh 2SI, LC, and the Classic. Today, Apple Europe has sales of over one and a half billion dollars, almost 30% of the total business and only 1,500 people. <sighs> I always wanted to make headline news myself. <laughs>